On Sunday, July 11, thousands of Cubans in dozens of cities around the island nation took to the streets to protest the country's communist dictatorship and persistent shortages in food, energy, and medicine, all of which have been made worse by the pandemic. The demonstrations have been enabled by social media and the internet, which only came to Cuba in a big way in late 2018, when President Miguel Diaz-Canel allowed citizens access to data plans on their cell phones. To better understand exactly how Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, and other social media platforms are connecting and empowering the Cuban people and undermining state control, Reason spoke with Ted Henkin, a sociologist at Baruch College and the co-editor of the collection Cuba's Digital Revolution. Ted Henkin, thanks for talking to uh, Reason. And the first question I'm going to ask is, how um, how how is the internet um, enabling what's going on in Cuba? Yeah, okay. I think it's important to start with what's not happening. Um, and that uh, is important because we tend to read foreign developments as they relate to the internet shallowly. Uh, uh, and, and examples of that uh, happened a lot with the Arab Spring and calling those things uh, Twitter or Facebook revolutions. And I think what's important to understand in that sense in general, and then Cuba specifically, is that the internet is acting as a facilitator um, of um, interests and groups and protests and discontent that traditionally were silenced and didn't have any place or a channel where they could really express themselves. Uh, so they're not internet re revolutions. I think it's also, it's important to call those internet enabled uprisings or protest movements, right? Um, um, there's an old concept um, called the dictator's dilemma, which is any technology that uh, may enter a, an authoritarian system as a double-edged sword and could uh, uh, help the dictator rule, uh, maybe legitimize the dictator or the authoritarian leader because of education or development or you know, any kind of um, other things that this technology, in this case, the internet enables. But it's a double-edged sword in that it can be used for a lot of other means by other actors. And this is certainly the case in Cuba. And so um, that dictator's dilemma, although sometimes it was read from a perspective of um, technological de determination, you know, whenever Internet enters a society, game over. And um, while Gonim, uh, the former Facebook executive who was Egyptian, you know, um, regretted his overly rosy uh, idea that you add internet in, and, and the regime is, is over. And he learned the hard way that yes, the internet and social media is, is useful and helpful to undermine monopoly control of media communications and, and other uh, aspects that are fundamentally important for uh, totalitarian systems, whether of the right or the left. But they don't uh, declare a winner. They change the game uh, in important ways. Can and you take a step back and explain why? How did the internet come to Cuba? Uh, yeah. you, you've written about how in uh, December 2018, you know, basically data plans were allowed for, for phone uh, service or 3G mobile. Why did that happen? Well, uh, that's a head scratcher uh, because, and, and, and it goes back to the dictator's dilemma. I mean, before that, you basically have a period in the 90s when Cuba was actually pretty advanced in, in, in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in terms of its networking and internet and, and that kind of thing. But uh, Fidel and the leaders at that time realized that this could be a, uh, they called it a wild cult that needed to be tamed, mm. right? And, um, and, 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 and they saw it as a, as a mortal threat um, because it undermined monopoly information control, which is one of the fundamental hallmarks of the Cuban system. Um, the mass media is propaganda in Cuba. Um, there's no two ways about it. And, and, uh, and almost everyone, uh, right or left, who understands and studies Cuba uh, would, would, would uh, grant that. Um, and so the internet, in that sense, um, you know, has a revolutionary, or you could say a counter-revolutionary um, uh, potential. Um, 
But because uh, uh, of underdevelopment, because of priorities and because of that fear, and you could even add because of the U.S. embargo, isolating and cutting Cuba off from these kinds of communication influences, technologies, um, because it was part of the overall embargo, uh, Cuba uh, isolated itself and was isolated. Um, that um, gradually ended uh, when Raul Castro became president in 2008, and gradually thereafter, Cubans started getting uh, gradually, but very gradually, online. They started getting cell phones. They started to be able to buy and use laptop computers, um, and 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 so, internet then grew from about, you know, three uh, percent connectivity, um, in about 2008. To around 2015 or so, you went up to about 15 or 20 percent, and that was enabled partly by the government rollout of first these uh, uh, very few uh, internet cafes, and then they kind of grew across the island to about a thousand of them. Then um, the next big thing was that Cubans uh, uh, got what are called uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, and these were set up largely in public parks throughout the island. And that was the kind of main way, the pioneering way that Cubans got online, you know, between about 2015 and 2018. Together with that, Cubans could contract to get home internet access. Um, and all of these were kind of ways that Cubans were getting online gradually. During this period was the heyday of the blogosphere in Cuba and uh, many independent voices uh, established themselves became uh, even well known outside of Cuba, not so much inside of Cuba by being bloggers. Ioani Sanchez is the uh, well, most well known, but there was a whole community and she was the tip of that iceberg. But because internet connectivity grew and because the, you know, the, the usefulness of a blog uh, is largely about uh, airing an opinion, uh, or an analysis, but not really um, communicating uh, reliable information. Uh, you know, Cuba is awash in opinions, and Cubans are really good at uh, uh, airing them, even with or within their system. But what they don't have is access to reliable information. What they have is access to government propaganda, uh, partisan propaganda from the Communist Party. And so what they really needed was reliable journalism, um, the facts, uh, reporting, information. And so uh, starting around 2014, up until today, you've seen the new kind of wave was uh, independent uh, digital journalism, media, startups, um, basically digital newspapers and magazines. And that um, it was fascinating because the bloggers were largely self-taught um, and opinionators, right? Um, uh, pundits, um, and very many of them, the leading ones, were often very critical voices uh, because that was what was missing, right? But um, many of the people who founded these independent uh, websites and newspapers were actually tra trained as journalists uh, in Cuba at Cuban universities, did their social service with their teeth, uh, you know, clenched tightly, uh, uh, survived that one or two year commitment that they had to give back to the system, and then they never wanted to work with the official media again mm -hmm. and started independent startups, but they didn't want to become dissidents. But of course they were targeted because they started independent uh, websites as enemies and uh, interrogated and um, detained and defamed. And so all of this was the kind of the groundwork that was laid. And then in December of 2018, the government opened up the possibility for people to get mobile internet. Why did they do that? Well, I think they did that for two main reasons. Number one, there was an accumulated demand that the whole world has internet, and we're supposedly in a um, computerization of society program. The government has a policy they call the informatización de la sociedad, um, um, which is somewhat of a joke, but uh, it is true that access has grown, prices have dropped, and the ways and means of access have grown, right? Um, uh, but Cuba is still a far cry from most of its neighbors and especially places like either China or the United States in terms of access. However, that became a before and after moment uh, because it allowed access to the internet to become now an anywhere, anytime, real-time phenomenon and not something that was restricted to a limited amount of time in a public park under the hot sun. And you could only, really 
do text or maybe film yourself talking, but you couldn't show people what was happening in real time. And as we saw on Sunday, that's a key distinction because what really sparked these the spread of this protest across the island was people filming live on Facebook and broadcasting that. And then other people in Cuba seeing those things broadcast in the next town over did it themselves. So why did the government do that? Because of accumulated pressure and demand. But the other reason it did it, Cuba is in constant economic crisis, right? It's inefficient. It's unproductive. The system is totally lacking in incentive structures. Um, the private sector is got a thousand and one uh, obstacles in its way. Um, and, um, and so the government sees the internet access as a cash cow because it is the sole internet provider through its telecom monopoly, um, Nauta. Uh, Atexa is the system, uh, is the company, and Nauta is the particular service where you get mobile data. And so, uh, but it was a Pandora's box that they were opening because it's become uh, 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 political headaches. Probably now they can look back and say, have, have outweighed the economic <laughs> windfall. And you've taught or, or you've written uh, your Twitter feed is, is filled with these images from cell phones. Um, the demonstrations are, you know, vast, right? I mean, they're not just happening in Havana or a couple of cities. They're all exactly. over the place. Yeah, what this is the, what's yeah. unprecedented about them mm -hmm. is that even if one of these had happened, it would be quite, quite surprising in Cuba. But the fact that they happen simultaneously and probably between 30 and 50 places around the country. Is what are the what are uh, besides Facebook Live or kind of uh, a video that's being shown uh, via phone or Facebook? Um, what are what are the other apps like? What are the what are the ways in which people are using the Internet to either protest or represent and share images of protest? Yeah, well, um, I guess you could say you can kind of break the apps that Cubans use in, in terms of what we're talking about into two groups, ones that allow horizontal encrypted private communication and others that are broadcast media, right? So Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are the go-to apps to broadcast or to share with the world or with a wide public uh, what's going on, including a live broadcast. Uh, in Cuba, they even have a word that they've been kind of invented uh, for Facebook Live. They don't call it Facebook Live. They call it una directa because it's a transmisión directa mm -hmm. al, al público, right? It's a direct transmission to the public, whoever's watching. And, and people who might be well-known because they do these things, um, you know, might announce, you know, in five minutes I'm going to be doing a, a directa uh, stay tuned. And then they're out in the street talking to people or showing some abuse by the police or whatever. Um, a, th a fourth uh, 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 channel is, of course, YouTube. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole uh, group of Cuban influencers and YouTubers. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, the president, Diaz Canel, angrily gave YouTube uh, an endorsement uh, on Sunday when he blamed this on these irresponsible mercenary youtubers and influencers mm -hmm. it was almost laughable that he was <laughs> he was blaming this on on youtubers and influencers right yeah. but but that that shows really that this is bro broken through and made isn't you know, that's pretty gutsy though i mean if you're doing something from facebook or youtube you are totally public i mean the government yes. knows exactly who you yes. are and they can kind of trace you down well, exactly. And so that's been a change over the last, let's say, 15 years is that, and this is one of the things they were chanting in the street on Sunday, we're, we're not afraid. No tenemos right. miedo. And, and this is a key part of the control in Cuba is keeping people afraid, mm -hmm. keeping them isolated from one another and not realizing that other people share their concerns or their, their complaints and keeping them afraid of sticking their head up and getting it chopped off. Right. And the internet has helped mitigate both of those because they see other people who share their concerns and then that helps them lose their fear. But there's always been in Cuban history, the last 62 years under the revolution, people who are brave enough to do that. And those people have grown, especially over the generations. Um, and, and so there's a lot of people who are out of the political closet, so to speak, in Cuba, who say, the same thing in public as that they would say in private. Uh, but there's a long tradition in Cuba of what they call a doble moral or a uh, duplicitousness that you practice strategically for survival because only among your family and friends are you going to, to trusted ones, are you going to be critical? 
because there's a whole network of what they call chivatos or uh, spies, mm -hmm. uh, people, tattletales who will report back. Uh, and, and many people who are interrogated the first time, they're offered that deal like, OK, you can keep doing this, but you have to report back to us. You have to work for us. Right. I know a number and I've interviewed a number of independent journalists in Cuba who who had exactly that 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 speech right what are the what are the private app or you know the encrypted apps or the peer-to-peer -peer apps that yes. are being, i mean is signal or other types of uh you know communication systems at work here as well there's there's four or five or six of them but four that i'll mention here because they seem to be the ones that people trust the most and have gone to the most i think what started as kind of an evolutionary process uh, people because they were on facebook first and because everyone they knew was on Facebook, it was easy to use Facebook Messenger because mm -hmm. you're like already on Facebook, you see that little lightning bolt and you go and you, you send this private message, a direct message, a DM, you, you DM somebody. But uh, people realized and learned the hard way maybe was that that's not encrypted and that can easily be hacked. Or if, if someone gets interrogated and someone gets a hold of your account, yeah. you know, that stuff can get out. So they migrated from Facebook Messenger to WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And WhatsApp is used in a thousand inventive ways. I mean, we might see WhatsApp because we have other options as mainly this or that. You know, we use it uh, in the United States or in the West uh, for these reasons. But in Cuba, they use it for a cornucopia of different things. A lot of the independent uh, startup uh, media sites use it as a way to broadcast their uh, information. Uh, they put a daily digest with links on WhatsApp. Um then um, WhatsApp, even though it's encrypted, uh, was questioned because it wasn't encrypted enough. And so people then started migrating to Telegram and to Signal. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a couple uh, of apps that are Cuban engineered or Cuban developed that are that are for that kind of thing. Um, but because they're de designed uh, and in some sense approved by the Cuban government, people don't trust them for real uh, 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 private communication. Um, so that that's the kind of situation there. Um, now, after December and 2018, um, things heated up because you had all of this, you know, prologue and context, and then suddenly people had access to horizontal real-time communication through mobile internet. And so in, in the two and a half years since then, culminating in Sunday's protests, you had this non-stop non -stop drumbeat of Every month or two, you would have some major mobilization that was a kind of a hashtag, mm -hmm. uh, social media enabled, or internet enabled protest, mobilization, um, call to people to do things, starting with a, a tornado that hit Havana in January of 2019. There was also this campaign on social media to get people to vote against the Constitution or to abstain from voting on it. There was a, a, a an LGBT, the kind of official LGBT march that was scheduled was canceled the last minute without any clear reason. So people organized an independent one uh, online, and then it they went into the street and marched, and then they were repressed. That was actually very similar to what we saw on Sunday, except it was just in one street in Havana. But it, it, people uh, marched through, and it wasn't political. It was about LGBT, right. but. It was independent, and so they shut it down, and they dragged people off. Um, and and all of that led to um, the November uh, of 2020 uh, sit-in outside the Ministry of Culture in response to a, a, a government raid of a hunger strike that was happening on the 26th of November. On the 27th, a bunch of mainstream, mostly young artists and intellectuals literally crowded and sat down outside the Ministry of Culture demanding answers from government about repression of people uh, for either free speech or artistic uh, freedoms and really the right to have rights in and of themselves. Um, that gave birth to uh, um, a kind of new dynamic because it was really uh, an unprecedented taking of public space. And as we learned again on Sunday when Diaz Canel spoke, La Calle es de los revolucionarios. The street belongs to the revolutionaries. That is an old saying. Um, uh, uh, public space is understood to be revolutionary space, and it can't be used in ways that are critical or counter to the revolution. At least that's the you know that's the that's the um, rule. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, unwritten, but certainly spoken and reminded. And they also say la, revol la, la universidad es de los revolucionarios. The university is for revolutionaries. And, and that began to be challenged. Uh, the street wasn't for the revolutionaries only. There's people in Cuba who are either non or counter-revolutionary. And then the final thing I think that was really important is this thing called Movimento, Movimiento San Isidro. Um, um, this is part of what we saw in November, a group of artists, mostly marginalized uh, artists from humble backgrounds and poor neighborhoods in Old Havana. They, um, they had done, been doing political art, street art for a few years, again, protesting against some new legislation that was rigidly controlling of the independent artist sphere in Cuba. And, uh, you know, they had kind of been a, a kind of a, a sideshow in terms of media attention, in terms of government repression. Um, but because their hunger strike was cracked down on, it was filmed on the cell phone, it was shared and spread across Cuba, that led to this uh, 500 people or so to turn up and sit in at the Ministry of Culture. So that movement has continued to be a kind of source, and that neighborhood, a source of protest and because that's a poor mostly afro-cuban neighborhood it it really stings the government because it a part of its legitimacy comes from the claim that it has been in favor of and supporting the the the, the least of these the the marginalized the traditionally discriminated against um, but those uh, people in that movement together with some afro-cuban um, musical artists and celebrities who live now mostly in Miami, all, are, all of whom are, are, are uh, Afro-descendant, um, they, de they decided to record a music video called Patria y Vida. Uh, and this was in uh, late January, early February. Um, and that just became a viral, you heard it all over the island. And that's what the other, that's the other main chant that people had when they were out in the street. Um, Patria and, y Vida, uh, yeah, homeland, go sorry, ahead. homeland and life, right? right? Uh, fatherland or homeland and life, right? Uh, that is a retort directly. If you're Cuban, you get it automatically because Fidel Castro used to end all of his speeches with this boilerplate declaration. He would say, fatherland or death, we shall overcome, right? We will be victorious. Uh, uh, patria o muerte. So you got a choice between homeland or death, or you have to give your life for the homeland. You know, you can interpret it different ways. Uh, venceremos. And so this was saying that essentially that government line is divisive. It, it basically turns us into revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries, uh, Cubans and traitors, and we need to unify uh, and we need to celebrate life and not like promise death if we're not like in line. Um, and the video became extremely popular. There were a number of other protests that happened uh, in you know March, April, May, where people sang that song or chanted that chant, but they were localized in Old Havana, um, and I think it took scarcity of medicine, scarcity of food, and a spike in COVID cases and deaths in the last let's say month in Cuba for it to turn into what we saw on Sunday. How do these um, protests compare to the protests uh, in 1994 in Cuba, which are seem to be the reference point that um, people are comparing to? Well, I would say that in most aspects, these are very different protests. Um, it, it's the reference point because there has been very few public protests um, in, in Cuban history under the revolution. This has been a very rare uh, occurrence. Um, and, um, and those protests are different. I mean, so, so in that sense, they're similar, right? They're mm -hmm. kind of a breakthrough moment of protest. Um, but the government got very quickly control of those. They were localized to uh, one part of Havana. Uh, um, they, only, they didn't last very long. And they were... Um, largely the result of the misery that Cuba was going through after the fall of the Soviet Union when, you know, exports and imports and food and fuel, everything dried up and people were getting on rafts and leaving the country. Mm -hmm. Fidel Castro himself actually went out into the street and helped to quell 
the protests, right? Um, but they were, you know, poor, marginalized, mostly male, probably a good portion Afro-Cuban people who were protesting, but but maybe more rioting, breaking things, right? It was it was more of a frustration. This this protest is different, it seems to me, in that it is pointedly political and anti. It's not just breaking things; it is demanding freedom. It is. Um, saying we are not afraid. The other big, big difference, of course, is that this is happening in 30 to 50 locations, yeah. cities and towns all over the island. And then the final difference, which is probably the key one, is that this is happening in the digital age, right? And this is happening when people have in their pockets, in their hands, cell phones. And the cell phone is, is a real game changer in terms of how these dynamics work because they allow, I mean, you would look at any of those pictures and two thirds of the people uh, are filming or holding up cell phones. Um, and you're obviously seeing it because someone is filming it and, and you're seeing it because someone had a cell phone. Um, so you don't have to rely on the Cuban media, which is mm -hmm. totally unreliable. You don't have to rely on the foreign media, the foreign correspondents, because they're often muzzled, controlled, mm -hmm. or can only say so much or they'll be sent packing very soon. These are citizens or independent journalists who are, who are filming. And, um, and and so that's why for the past two days that we've, you know, uh, since the since Sunday, the government shut off the Internet because they know that 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 um, that helps spread the discontent and and and, and the virus of protest is seeing other people protest or seeing them get it clubbed in the head. Right. One of the, uh, you know, hallmarks of kind of contemporary, you know, Internet age protests is that they're distributed. You know, people have cell phones, people upload footage, images, et cetera. Um, in the Arab Spring, you know, a decade or so ago, uh, we saw similar images and similar activity. It didn't really come to much in terms of transformative change in the countries most affected by it. What do you think, what are the lessons from the Arab Spring uh, that might end up kind of shedding light on what's going on in Cuba and where it's going to end up? Well, I would, two names come to mind or three names come to mind of people who have uh, experienced and then written about this uh, in, in, I think, smart ways. Uh, the first is a guy named, almost everyone knows, is Malcolm Gladwell. He had a New mm -hmm. Yorker article uh, about a decade ago was commenting on this. And he was kind of poo-pooing the, the, the Twitter revolution because he argued, based on research that has been done, uh, that this is based on weak ties. It's very good at mobilizing people, mm -hmm. but it's very bad at capitalizing on that mobilization because those people have very little invested and very little uh, authority or structure or organization to turn discontent, even protest in the streets, into something that could potentially replace or challenge a government. So uh, uh, also while Ghanim, um, the Egyptian Facebook um, executive who started that uh, Facebook group that you know helped bring down the Egyptian government, he was very, um, let's say, optimistic that you just need an internet, right? And that will help you change things and get rid of authoritarian uh, leaders. But later on, he has this, um, TED talk where he basically says I was wrong because, you know, as we've learned in the West uh, in recent years, right, uh, fake news, amateurism uh, can't can't replace journalism. Right. Uh, meaning that you don't know if it's on the Internet, if it's true. The government then knows that. So it floods the Internet with unverifiable claims. Um, so everybody can play that game and it doesn't get you anywhere. Also, uh, short messages on Facebook or Twitter tend to not leave room for reflection, uh, thought. There's more like right. a got you. Um, there's a distinction between calling someone out and calling them in, right? Calling them out is kind of exposing them publicly to shame, which doesn't really help build consensus or learn mm -hmm. lessons or move together forward. It's just embarrassing or humiliating somebody. Calling them in would be, you know, reaching out to them in private and saying, hey, you know, I disagree with you for these reasons. Let's have coffee and talk. Right. Uh, but it's more of a gotcha game. And so he learned the hard way that 
the internet is really good uh, at certain things that can help undermine or tear down things, uh, but it's not good at building things because it's a distributed network without a central authority structure. And, and, and Gladwell actually compared that to the civil rights movement and, and, and Greensboro back you know, in the 50s and 60s, where you had this structure that was born either out of the black church in the South or out of the historically black colleges and universities. And those, that's where the backbone of people who were willing to, those are strong ties, right? And so that distinction is important. A final person is a, is a uh, sociology professor um, in the U.S. She's of Turkish origin. Her name is, uh, I say Zainab Tufeki, is probably saying it wrong, but, um, but she's a brilliant uh, public intellectual um, and has a whole book called uh, Twitter and Tear Gas about uh, this dynamic. Um, and, and she certainly recognizes the power of the Internet, uh, but she also talks about networked authoritarianism and how governments can play this game, muddy the waters, and they can easily make accessible information unusable because we don't know what to trust or believe. And then, of course, they do have a master switch that they can turn right. off and on. And what is the role? I mean, this was certainly the case in Egypt where it you know, was relatively, you know, this, uh, maybe not relatively easy, but it was, you know, it was one thing to tear down a government or a secular government and a president, but then the army really is calling a lot of the shots in a, in a country like Egypt. Um, and that also seems to be true in Cuba, so that you have the government, but then there's, you know, the guys with guns and tanks who are controlling things. How do, how do they fit into the equation of like, what do we look for to see where this is heading in Cuba? Yes. Well, um, I mean, I think um, in that sense, it's, it's kind of, um, it's a bleak situation because remember Raul Castro, um, Fidel Castro's younger brother, the former president of Cuba, who just retired a few years ago uh, from president and then retired a few months ago as the head of the Communist Party. For his whole career, he was the head of the uh, armed forces. He was the minister of armed mm -hmm. forces. He built the armed forces. He put everybody who's in the armed forces in the places that they are. The armed forces also controls a big parts of the Cuban economy. A lot of the armed forces uh, generals went to business school in the 90s uh, through a program and, and they were put in places to run different parts of the economy. And so, um, and so there's a lot that those people have in terms of power and a lot they have to lose if the regime changes. Um, economically, um, especially, right? And so, um, there's going to be, uh, I mean, the, 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 the police are seen by people generally, and especially the secret police, the state security system, the Ministry of the Interior, are seen as the bad guys. But I think that the, the power behind them are, uh, is the military. But the military isn't traditionally seen as a bad or evil or repressive organization because they have mandatory military service for males in Cuba. And so people have a familiarity with it as something normal, whereas they see police and especially the state security as the kind of henchmen of repression. Um, but I don't know how true that is in actual fact. Uh, it's just a good cop, bad cop, maybe routine. Um, and and so the other thing is that even though uh, Raul Castro is old and officially retired and has no official uh, portfolio, um, uh, he certainly uh, has moral authority among the people who are in power, including the president, but also everyone else behind and, and beneath and around the president. And you have, you know, and you have the government, you have the military, you have the Ministry of the Interior, but then you also have the party. But 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 traditionally, Fidel was really in control of all those organizations, yeah. and then that was passed to Raúl. One thing to watch, however, of course, is that when popular discontent uh, uh, overflows and expresses itself in these popular protests and street marches and et cetera. Um, what does the middle class do in terms of which side does it join? People who are, might be celebrities or people who have something to lose, but also maybe a lot to gain for a change. But then what elements within the governing structure might get peeled off or split and side with the protesters in one way or another, or will they just obey orders? And so that question is too early to 
ask or even answer, but it's something that I think we would be, we would be watching for in the days and weeks to come. What, uh, you know, everyone in the United States, if you're on the left, if you're on the right, if you're libertarian, whatever, you know, people are going to project onto Cuba, you know, their ideology. So, um, you know, how how do we disentangle that? And is it, I mean, is this fundamentally it's a Cuban phenomenon, right? Um, and is it going to mostly be resolved uh, you know, within Cuba, or what are the, you know, if if this was happening pre-91, it would, you know, there would be a superpower overlay on all of this. But, you know, how do we disentangle, yeah. um, you know, American ideology from what's actually going on? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think that, yeah, it, it is hard to see Cuba because all of us have blinders or lenses or tinted glasses, depending mm-hmm. on what we see. I have a friend in Cuba who would host uh, delegations. He's a he's a journalist there, and he would often host delegations. And he said, whenever they had people from the third world, developing world, they would always ask about health care and education. And whenever they had people from Europe or the United States, they would always ask about you know human rights and democracy, right? And so that's certainly true. The United States, Cubans, uh, I mean uh, Americans. Um, you know, on 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 the left, they tend to do the same thing as people in the third world, and on the right, the same thing as you know. But um, I think there's also a, a projection, and Cuba has been really good at, at, at playing this role at seeing uh, Cuba as a David and the United States as a Goliath, and mm-hmm. reading every, everything through the embargo and the U.S. imperial relation. And if you're a student of Cuban history, you certainly there's certainly reason for that frame. But the problem is that many people stop reading Cuban history after 1959, or I only read it up to 59, because after that time, gradually, and then definitely by, you know, by the mid 60s or late 60s, you know, there's a Goliath of the Cuban government and the the David of the Cuban people, right? And so it's important to see that Cuba is not one thing, it's many things. Right. And there's certainly a divide between state and society, right? Where the state, of course, claims to legitimately represent and serve the people. Um, but that's not true in any country, but it's especially not true in a country that lacks a whole range of fundamental freedoms and civic civil liberties, right? Um, and just because they have access to these other things like healthcare and, and education for free, and for a time it was even quality for free, <laughs> but not anymore really, yeah. um, that doesn't make it okay then to not have uh, the other freedoms, right? Um, so I think what's most important, and this is hard for Americans to do, or many any outsider to do, is to try to tune in to the various different perspectives that are coming from within Cuba that are, let's say, unfiltered by uh, um, propaganda, right? I mean, everyone has different opinions or takes, but if you have a system or a party that is editing or censoring or turning what you do or say into propaganda, um, then it's really hard to hear voices. So I, I try because, you know, I, I, you know, half my life is lived in Spanish. Um, I try to listen uh, very intently to the nuances that Cubans themselves are uh, sharing and reporting. But it's hard for Americans to do that because we get a an American English version and is often watered down. Um, and it's just maybe a headline or uh, breaking news. Um, I think that my, my, um, my, my, I guess my advice would be this. When people present Cuba as one or the other, I say it's both and, right? When people present it as this revolutionary society that stood up to Uncle Sam and successfully resisted globalization and imperialism and capitalism, I say yes. And when people, you know, but it's also mm-hmm. these other things that you could find in George Orwell, uh, mm-hmm. Animal Farm. I mean, I reread Animal Farm uh, recently and I was like, I could have read this 20 years ago and I would have understood Cuba. Not totally true, but all of the stuff that's in Animal Farm exists in Cuba, even though they also stood up against a, um, you know, a, a Goliath, uh, an imperial power that 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 was ignorant and arrogant and its policy and, and continues to be so largely, uh, um, uh, especially under Trump, but but even, uh, uh, you know, remnants of that under Obama and Biden. Um, but at the same time, that shouldn't silence us or cause us to bite our tongue when 
it's very clear that people are out in the street chanting liberty, right? Give me liberty or give me death. I mean, they're saying, give me liberty and give me life, right? Um, and uh, we're not afraid. And they're certainly not complaining about the U.S. embargo. They probably did that last week at a government-sponsored protest. Um, so I think that it's, 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 it's hard but very important to keep two contradictory ideas in your mind at the same time. And I even see them not as contradictory. They both can be true at the same time, right? Is there anything that the United States, which obviously has a long and generally awful relationship with Cuba uh, in terms of, you know, trying to dictate terms uh, to that country, uh, you know, is there anything that the U.S. can be doing that would help facilitate a, you know, a, a flourishing of actual kind of civil society and freedom within Cuba? Or is it something where, you know, whatever whatever we do is going to end up making the situation worse. As I said before, the first thing we can do is realize we have, you know, the, the, the future of Cuba is not going to be decided in Washington or even Miami. It's going to be mm -hmm. decided in Cuba. However, um, I think that most of the moves that Obama made were move, moves that are borne out by logic, reason, and history. The things that we tried in various ways over 50 years didn't work, it didn't liberate Cuba. If anything, it gave the government a convenient excuse, a Goliath to blame its problems mm -hmm. on. Um, and, and that's not even to talk about the you know, ethical or human rights issues of the kind of embargo we had. I'm not completely against you know, sanctions or embargoes, but they need to be targeted, they need to be uh, focused. And they're, I mean, clearly not effective. If right. the idea was to destabilize the the Castro regime, a, you know, a complete failure. Right. So, uh, what Obama did, I thought, was to continue to rhetorically uh, celebrate and stand up for a classic liberal freedoms rights, mm -hmm. um, and and he did that not just in a in, in an op ed or in a White House briefing. He went to Havana and he gave a speech to the president and people of Cuba, and he said those things explicitly, unapologetically, respectfully. He also recognized other things that were um, that Cubans could be proud of, that Cubans had in common, right? And then they set in motion a bunch of policies and pol uh, uh, that were trying to find common ground to try to get at least pick the low low hanging fruit before they could get to the bigger issues that maybe Obama didn't have control over, like the embargo, like Guantanamo, naval base in Cuba, like democracy and human rights and freedom of speech and such. Um, so I think that a return to that policy is wise, mm -hmm. uh, strategic, slow maybe. Um, right now, I think the most pressing thing is humanitarian uh, assistance, humanitarian aid because of the food shortage, the medicine shortage, and the spike in COVID cases. Those are all important, and I think uh, priorities right now. Other policies that would be, uh, you know, uh, returning to some kind of thaw or reengagement um, should come later. I think in general we should eliminate the embargo. Um, I mean, the the details about how to do that, when to do that, how much at first or later is is important. But I think Obama had the goal. If he was in his power, he would have gotten rid of the embargo. Um, None of this is going to bring freedom to Cuba, but I think it will remove the United States as a as convenient scapegoat. It will allow greater people-to-people -people contacts, uh, economic engagement that could, you know, at least turn Cuba into a China, if not a free country, right? So that right. there's some more freedom, economic freedoms, there's more prosperity. You know, I mean, many people in Cuba, there's a, there's a quote I heard that was really good. It was like, we were so, we were so hungry in Cuba that we ate our fear. Right. Uh, and they didn't have any more fear. So they went out into the streets. Right. And I think that uh, that desperation is what's happening in Cuba. And that's partly the design of, of the embargo. Right. To make people desperate. So they rise up. So in someone, someone certainly smiling who supports the embargo right now because they're saying, finally, it's working. And thanks to Trump. Right. Um, but I think the price of that is far too high in humanitarian terms to claim it as a victory. Um, and also, it's not, not clear that that's going to change anything either. So do you think the Biden administration will, um, you know, have the type of policy that you hope uh, the U.S. would take towards Cuba? Yes, I think it's certainly uh, um, 
in the wheelhouse of the Biden administration. They're reviewing that policy, but they're going slow, I think, for three reasons. They're going slow, first of all, because there's a lot of other priorities, huge priorities, uh, starting with COVID, starting with repairing the carnage left by, by Trump, you know, the American carnage left by the Trump administration. Um, and at least from the perspective of the Democrats, right? Um, so that's number one. Number two is that the Cuban government, instead of reaching across and shaking Obama's hand, they uh, rhetorically, after he left in that state visit in 2016, they attacked his intentions as being, uh, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing. They uh, circled the wagons and, 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 and uh, tightened uh, the restrictions. They increased repression. So in the short term, the, the Obama um, open hand scared them more than the Bush or other presidents right. closed fist because they're, they're used to having an enemy and they reacted and actually didn't take advantage of this golden historic opportunity to not just normalize relations with the U.S., but take that as an opportunity to change some necessary things within Cuba, even within the structure of the system of the revolution. So that then led a lot of people in South Florida to say that was a great gesture. That was a great try, Obama, but it didn't work. Trump all the way, right? And that leads me to the third issue, which is South Florida and uh, presidential elections, right? Uh, the reason that Biden's not moving quickly on this is that uh, the Democrats lost Florida and they lost it by a lot relative in relative terms. And uh, it's 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 it seems very likely based on exit polling and other kind of surveys that that uh, the Cubans and other um, you know, Latinos in South Florida who are refugees from repressive uh, mm -hmm. leftist countries in Latin America uh, were part of that um, swing away, away from the Democrats. There's probably a lot of Latinos and Cubans who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump twice, right? Because when he won and then when he lost the country but won Florida. And um, and that's also for the, the congressional elections, not just the next presidential election. Final question. Uh, where do you think we'll be uh, or where do you think Cuba will be in you know six months time? Will the uh, will the protests have been swept away? Will they they will they have achieved some kind of goal um, or will they just be ongoing? I am not um, hopeful that things will change for the better rapidly in Cuba. Uh, this protest is certainly hopeful in the sense that a massive swath of people who had bitten their tongue and were silent and fearful did take to the streets. And that's a, that's a clear warning to the government that it needs to move faster to respond. And, and unfortunately, the government, at least in the short term, is blaming everything on the U.S. Um, and calling most of the people, you know, scum or uh, traitors or mercenaries. Um, but they also know that this is the most serious threat that they've ever seen in 62 years. And unless they respond to the fundamental issues that are driving it, this, these protests are gonna uh, maybe go underground, be quelled for today and tomorrow, but, uh, but come back up uh, a month from now, two weeks from now, some other spark. If they don't get a hold of COVID, if they don't get, a, a, get their economic house in order and, and eliminate some of the scarcities, but none of that's going to happen quickly. The government doesn't move quickly and it doesn't change uh, these policies. And, and it's been getting advice after advice after advice from within the country about these things. And it moves extremely slowly. The real question for me is the Cuban people. After this taste of a day of street marches and shouting in the street and losing their fear, are they going to go back and um wait again for something to happen or are they going to push the issue um i mean when we had a few years ago in iran a similar like massive protests but they they ended up being either crushed or um you know the government outweighed them repressed mm -hmm. them and then nothing fundamental changed right um so uh at this point it was certainly refreshing i mean i have cuban american friends who didn't leave cuba that long ago who spent the last two days crying from shock and happiness and concern and relief because 
in their whole lives, they never thought they would see the day. I mean, these kind of things are common in, 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 in Little Havana uh, in Miami, but they're unheard of largely in, in Cuba itself. And to see it happen so many places, so many people um, is, is breathtaking. And so it's certainly something to watch, but I can't, I can't foresee how in six months things will be fundamentally different, but I certainly hope they're moving in that direction. All right, we're going to leave it there. Ted Henkin, thanks for talking to Reason. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care, and we'll keep our eyes on Cuba. <laughs>